you. Today we are launching the fact sheet, which was done jointly uh, with OHCHR. But above all, for those who are joining our monthly webinars, this is an opportunity to exchange around a topic, to ask questions, to share maybe some of the challenges you may face around this topic in your work, or on the contrary, also the good practices or some emerging uh, practices that you have already in place. This fact sheet that um, I will uh, put in the chat uh, the link to has been uh, actually shared just recently during the last 49th Human Rights Council session, and it's in a way symbolic because it was the same week when the Special Rapporteur on Climate Change was appointed. So there is a momentum. There is definitely much more attention now. What is the impact on human rights of persons in relation to climate change and especially in relation to persons who have been forcibly displaced? So it's really uh, good timing and uh, in today's event, we will look into those topics. And what's interesting is that we will hear about different tools and documents that can support you in your work on this topic in the field. So we will uh, we will hear from uh, various colleagues presenting uh, documents or tools that have been developed and that are complementary and that can maybe inspire you a little bit in terms of what can be done and how to take this forward in practical terms uh, in your field work. So, uh, we very much look forward to this event. You already know the ground rules for our exchange, so um, if you can stay on mute, but uh, please do use very actively the chat throughout the event. We will be monitoring it constantly. And if you would like then to share anything in live or direct, please raise your hand as well. Uh, we will be monitoring those, of course, very closely as we come to the um, questions and discussion part of, uh, of our webinar. So with that, I, I will not take more of uh, your time before, and I would like to present you the panelists today. We are very fortunate to have with us today uh, Cecilia Jimenez Namari, who is the special reporter on the human rights of internally displaced persons. And then, of course, many of you uh, know Cecilia. Uh, we have had many interactions uh, with her uh, in her mandate, and uh, she has been very actively involved in uh, clusters work and uh, um, uh, interactions with, uh, with field colleagues. And we will hear from her about uh, her work uh, on the topic in the opening remarks. Then we will go to the panel and here we will hear from Isabel Michel, who works for UNHCR, who will present us the fact sheet that uh, we are officially launching today, but also mention the different legal frameworks that govern the situation of displaced persons so that we have a bit more clarity. We won't go into details, of course, but Isabel will also point you to various resources that exist and we can take it more in detail than bilaterally if you feel the need. After Isabel, we will hear from Alice Ochsenbein from OHCHR and she will um, share with us very concrete examples about OHCHR work in the Sahel region to about projects that are in place, uh, the links between climate change and human rights and what it means in practice. So this will be very interesting to to listen to Alice. And uh, we will also have a presentation from Nancy Polutan from the Global Protection Cluster, who will uh, outline the key elements of the Global Protection Cluster's guidance on protection in the context of climate change and how, again, very practically this can relate to your work. 
So you see, we try to make it very practical, uh, point you to existing resources or practices that are there. So take today's events as, as really a platform to connect on this topic, to start uh, discussing it and um, guide you through the existing resources that are already there. We will also have an intervener from the floor Meron, who will uh, share with us the information about UNHCR guidance that can be relevant to you if you are a UNHCR colleague, but also uh, an NGO or civil society member. And we will open up for discussion uh, questions before wrapping up this event. So as you see, a uh, very, very interesting program, we hope. <laughs> and uh, I see a lot of colleagues are joining from different operations, Uganda, Pretoria, uh, Congo, Chad, uh, Mali, Jordan, Ethiopia. So it's fantastic to see uh, all of you connected. Please do uh, continue introducing yourself in the chat. And with that, I think we can start and I would like to give the floor please to the special rapporteur, uh, to Cecilia, to open our event, please. Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, and really sincere thanks to the UNHCR for this invitation. But before I give the substance of my opening remarks, I really would like to acknowledge the role that Valerie has undertaken in her fantastic work as the task team co-lead uh, before she takes up your, you know, your, her, her next field assignment with UNHCR. Valerie and I got to know each other very well in close quarters when I undertook my visit to Niger uh, a few years ago. And since then, it's been a very good experience working with her, very professional. So I wish you luck in your next assignment. Having collaborated um, with you, with the GPC, with the clusters, UNHCR together on many occasions at global and field levels in several years, this event and the publications that it will be launching are actually indicative of the dedication of Valerie and you, all of you colleagues, on behalf of both UNHCR and GPC to fostering multi-stakeholder human rights engagement and generating the momentum on important displacement issues. My mandate as a special uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons has in fact benefited from these stakeholder efforts and the quality of the engagement of the UNHCR and the GPC teams and human rights champions. The contributions, your contributions to developing, for example, my reports to the United Nations General Assembly and the UN uh, Human Rights Council has been most valuable, as well as the dissemination of those reports and picking up on the recommendations. This is why I very much welcome today's discussion and exchange of experience, as, these, um, as this discussion and exchange speak also to my report very closely to the UN General Assembly in 2020. In, in that year, I presented a report to the GA, which was very much accepted and endorsed and acknowledged by the international community, save one state at the time. And this report was on internal displacement in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change. And if you are wondering which state was not very happy with my report, where I can tell you it's the USA, or it was the USA. In any case, um, I think now with the change of uh, government, uh, there has been really as well an acknowledgement that the report that I presented to the GA in 2020 was very much um, relevant and still very valuable particularly because of the issues that slow onset adverse effects of climate change and the links that it has to internal displacement are pertinent and valid. Human mobility in the context of slow onset adverse effects of climate change can indeed take many forms. 
including displacement, migration, and planned relocation. And this may be internal or cross-border. In most cases, movement is not entirely voluntary or forced, but rather falls somewhere on the continuum between the two with different degrees of voluntariness and constraint. And where, however, where such voluntariness is absent, for example, when the place becomes inhabitable, such mobility falls squarely in the notion of forced displacement. And this is, uh, th these issues are, I I'm bringing up these issues because they actually speak a lot with regard to protection and the way that we international um, um, entities are able to respond to that situation. Now, there is now extensive evidence of the widespread impacts of climate change on the enjoyment of human rights, such as the rights to life, health, housing, food, water, and education, cultural rights, and collective rights. And this, of course, includes the rights of indigenous peoples and the right to self-determination. Those impacts contribute to displacement, and displacement further impacts the enjoyment of human rights. I actually look forward to hearing more of the UNHCR's analysis of the legal considerations for claims for international protection, which aptly warms against a narrow focus on a single climate change event or disaster and emphasizes that climate change and disasters may have significant adverse effects on state and societal structures, individual well-being and the enjoyment of human rights. So a slow onset adverse effects of climate change can turn into a disaster displacement and can pose, do pose direct risks to human rights. The lens I actually propose has three areas of consideration. The first is the vulnerability of persons impacted in terms of human rights. And you know this. As climate change affects different areas in varied ways, human mobility patterns, including internal displacement, and impacts on human rights are context specific and the level of vulnerability of individuals and households play plays an important role in their mobility for example communities lying in certain areas such as low lying coastal areas small island states arctic ecosystems are more exposed to slow onset events and therefore at a higher risk of disaster displacement and this is not to minimize the effects of sudden onset displacement either. Moreover, people depending on local natural resources for their livelihoods are affected and more directly and at higher risk of displacement. This includes indigenous peoples, pastoralists, fisher folk, and farmers. Within these vulnerable groups are specific persons as well, who may be more vulnerable to risks to their human rights, such as children, elderly, people with disabilities. The second point I would like to uh, raise is that the enhancement of affected populations, political agency is important. In many contexts, they display remarkable strength, resourcefulness, and resilience in the face of disasters and displacement. Despite the challenges, barriers, and discrimination that they face, they also have traditional knowledge and valuable perspectives that can contribute to the design of programmatic responses, disaster risk reduction strategies, and durable solutions. It is therefore essential that participation of internally displaced persons be placed at the core of all our responses. The third and last I, uh, area for due attention is the state's primary responsibility and for its human rights obligations vis-a-vis -vis its populations. And this should be paired with the essentiality of solidarity from other members of the international community, including other states and, of course, UN agencies. This should not be merely in the form of humanitarian assistance complementary to the state, but likewise in their own implementation of its own protective and, ju and due diligence standards under international conventions such as the Paris Agreement. A very, as I said, I very much welcome this event and also uh, the appointment of a new special rapporteur on climate change um, who had just been appointed um, uh, recently and he is from Tuvalu and actually I look, very much look forward to, to meeting him 
uh, when uh, during the annual uh, special rapporteurs meeting we will be having in June in uh, Geneva, and um, and during the uh, I recall that during the adoption of the resolution in the UN Human Rights Council, the adoption of that resolution establishing the Special Rapporteur on Climate Change, I was participating in a side event where I was asked what will be the relevance of a Special Rapporteur on Climate Change when many of us Special Rapporteurs, not just myself, but for example, migration, um, discrimin uh, racial discrimination, violence against women have actually issued respective reports on climate change. And what I said was, that this special rapporteur will really be in the position not only to synthesize all our analysis on the different effects of climate change, but also to collectively put that analysis um, in, in, in terms of how they can be strategically implemented by the international community. So um, it will be very important that it will be very important that we actually give our support to the new special rapporteur on on the on climate change because his his position his um uh, the issue that he will be taking up is quite you know um, important in the crisis that we are right now facing. So I gratefully welcome the complementary perspectives that the panelists bring here today with the underlying experience synthesized and set out in the recent pieces of guidance. Thank you very much again for having me. Thank you, Valerie. Good luck with your new position. And I look forward to continuing the work with you and as well with everybody else in the UNHCR, of course, and the GPC. Over to you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, as always, your uh, remarks are so inspiring, comprehensive and uh, to the point. And of course, your report that you presented uh, uh, to the General Assembly in 2020 on the slow onset of adverse effects of climate change is really a reference point for many of us. And uh, it's important that colleagues also if you have not seen it, get familiarized with it and Kim has posted it in the chat, the link, uh, because now we also need to see in terms of follow up to the recommendations coming from uh, and the special rapporteur's uh, report and uh, uh, we have all a role to play in, in their implementation. So uh, I um, draw your attention to it and thank you also Cecilia for making the link with the mandate of the new special rapporteur on climate change. I have pasted in the chat also uh, the link to the resolution that Cecilia mentioned and the key functions of the mandate so that you have it uh, under your eyes if useful. But uh, just for your information, we are also planning a webinar hopefully in June with uh, the special reporter on climate change. But thank you so much, Cecilia, for framing our event, giving us uh, really now uh, the space to uh, to enter into the discussion. Thank you for all the work you are doing uh, through your mandate in that regard. And uh, thank you also for joining us uh, from from Philippines uh, for today's event. So uh, we will now open the panel and I would like to give the for floor first to Isabel, Isabel Michal, who will uh, present us the fact sheet uh, that has been done jointly with OIT CHR as mentioned and also give some hints on on the legal frameworks and share relevant resources. So please, uh, Isabel, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Isabel Michal and I'm working in the Division of International Protection of uh, UNHCR, focusing exclusively on uh, legal and normative aspects for the protection of people displaced in the context of climate change and disasters. Um, I will certainly not give um, new um, uh, information or insights um, following uh, the Cecilia's intervention. Thanks a lot, Cecilia. I think you you really uh, summarized well all the key picture of, of the topic and I will uh, I will echo uh, what, what you said and emphasize some specific aspects. 
um, it was um, not easy to um, develop a fact sheet uh, in only a few pages on such a, a broad topic where everything's interrelated and we're uh, really talking about how to handle complexity. Um, the fact sheet is aimed to give you um, um, a very um, a short and brief overview of the impacts of the um, uh, of climate change on the human rights of people, emphasizing that indeed it may uh, hinder the enjoyment of a, a, a range of human rights, including, um, as Cecilia mentioned, the right to to water, to adequate housing, to uh, uh, cultural rights to food, um, etc. And um, impacting also on the risk of displacement of, of people uh, in many contexts, but also it impacts the rights on people who are already displaced in many situations. And we see in the operations we're working on, uh, on how um, how, how heavy the impacts of climate change is in, in the way we're operating and uh, adding also to already complex situations, including in relation to conflict um, or violence. Um, of course, um, most of the people who are displaced in the context of climate change and disasters are internally displaced remaining within their countries where um, um, IDP related uh, frameworks uh, are applicable, uh, but also some people may um, uh, be forced to, to flee their homes and cross borders. Um, in 2020, UNIT shares issued legal considerations regarding claims for international protection made in the context of uh, the impacts of climate change and disasters. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, this document, but I will put a link uh, in the chat box so that you can have easy access to it. Um, basically, it reminds that even though there's no specific mention to climate change or disasters in the um, 1951 Refugee Convention, um, the, uh, climate change uh, having an impact um, on um, amplifying existing uh, vulnerabilities or fragilities, both of individuals, but also of societies. Uh, may uh, the, the, the 1951 Convention may be relevant for people who are displaced in those contexts. We are never talking of a standalone um, criteria relating to climate change or disasters, but rather it uh, has impacts on the overall protection environment of people with whom we're working and who may uh, be in need of, of protection uh, in those contexts. So uh, the, the, the refugee instruments may be relevant uh, and applicable in those contexts. Uh, of course, the regional refugee instruments, such as the UAU Convention and the Cartagena Declaration, may also be relevant, as they both include a, an extended uh, refugee criteria, uh, which uh, relates to events seriously disturbing public order. So there's no internationally agreed definition of what public order is, but there is a lot uh, of research ongoing um, on um, how to analyze the impacts of climate change on public order in, 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 in specific countries and situations and how to interpret that specific criteria um, uh, in relation to, to, to people displaced uh, in the context of climate change uh, and disasters and how to apply those elements. So really uh, watch this space. Uh, we'll certainly uh, circulate more information, but um, uh, we are really uh, engaging on um, um, long-term efforts uh, toward developing indicators, uh, proxies, and, and, and uh, um, elements to, to interpret um, uh, that, that criteria. 
Um, of course, when not all people will be eligible to refugee status when they uh, cross borders in the in that context, and complementary forms of protection are certainly uh, relevant and crucial based on the principle of uh, non refoulement. Um, and um, in uh, January 2020, we 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 remember there was a, a milestone decision by the Human Rights Committee on the a case of Tetiota uh, from Kiribati. Bas, uh, who sought asylum in, in, in New Zealand um, in the context of sea level rise uh, that uh, affects um, particularly small uh, small island countries. And the Human Rights Committee in its decision uh, reminded that people should not uh, be returned uh, in countries where, uh, the, where their life would be at, uh, at real risk of irreparable harm. And also uh, reminded the collective responsibilities of the of, of countries and the international community to work together to uh, to prevent displacement from from occurring and to mitigate the impacts of climate change altogether. So once again, we are talking about um, uh, the co complex situation where all elements are interrelated uh, and uh, are all different sides of the same uh, same issue. Issue. And um, um, temporary forms of protection and stay arrangement uh, may also be a practical ways of providing protection to people in need where no other uh, um, um, forms of protection would be uh, immediately available uh, to respond to, to immediate uh, protection needs. Um, the fact sheet provides uh, a few um, quick recommendations on how to, pro to protect human rights uh, of persons displaced in the context of climate change. They are certainly not exhaustive, but might provide you with um, uh, hooks to, 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 to disseminate key messages uh, on this. We know that advocacy, awareness raising uh, on human rights in those contexts are really um, uh, an element of, uh, of engagement uh, of all partners in the field. So these are a few examples of key messages that you, you might want to raise and build on. Um, but certainly um, we, we, we are all working together and partnering in many operations of the world. So happy to, to um, build on that and, and, and work together uh, in joint messages, depending on the events uh, uh, where, where uh, we are all uh, working and uh, engaging in. Um, and the fact sheet uh, in the last part gives a few examples of, of good practices um, um, where uh, UNHCR and OHCHR uh, worked on addressing human rights uh, related issues in the context of climate change and disasters. Uh, what I would like to um, raise uh, once again is that all these aspects and components are interrelated. We see that, as Cecilia mentioned, it, it's a continuum uh, of mobility and we need to address uh, uh, all uh, all needs wherever uh, they are, uh, but they all feed into each other. Uh, internal displacement, migration as a way of preventing displacement, displacement across borders um, are, are really, um, um, in, in, there are strong interlinkages between um, those elements as they are on the different components on disaster risk reduction, um, human rights engagement, um, um, how to address uh, these issues, innovation, finance, um, really um, in this area, uh, as in many, many other, but may, maybe even more uh, than in others, it's about a collective uh, effort and responsibility uh, to avert minimize and address um, displacement in, in, in this context and related protection needs. Um, in 2018, UNHCR is issued in the frame of the task force uh, on displacement of the Varsho International Mechanism under the UNEF 
convention, uh, framework convention on climate change, a mapping of existing international and regional guidance and instruments to avert, minimize and address displacement and to uh, find uh, durable solutions to displacement in the context of climate change and disasters. It is a, a, a very a comprehensive list of existing instruments uh, in all these aspects. So it might be also a very um, uh, good reference documents to tap in, uh, also in, uh, in in the frame of your uh, work in cooperation with, with governments or uh, other actors. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, refer to that. I will also put a link in the chat box in case it is uh, useful. Um, my last point is about um, our um, um, cooperation also and um, work um, in a complementary manner uh, in um, headquarters, in the um, back offices and in the field um, between uh, <laughs> you uh, and, and myself and us. Uh, at headquarters, um, policy discussions and elements and field experience it, and issues really work together and fit into each other. So uh, we never hesitate to contact us and to ask if you need guidance, if you need um, uh, insights to structure your thinking, to complement, to check that um, uh, the, the, the key messages are, are, are audible uh, with your uh, um, counterparts. But also please uh, share with us good practices uh, protection issues, uh, evidence, links that you see between all different aspects. We will use uh, them. Um, uh, there are many um, policy discussions everywhere and we need to know what's happening in the field to ensure that we, uh, the policy guidance uh, and, and strategies actually reflect uh, the actual uh, protection needs and uh, operational constraints also uh, that uh, you are encountering in the field. Um, I think I will leave it here, but uh, thanks a lot for your attention and remaining um, at your disposal in case you have questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for this overview, for first introducing us to the fact sheet and colleagues, I have posted it in the chat. Uh, you have a link there with the different recommendations Isabel was mentioning and the framework so that you can refer to it, but also for the information that you have uh, outlined to us about the existing initiatives and the mapping and the ongoing work and research. And I'm sure Isabel, Colleagues would have uh, quite a lot of questions. I see already some coming in the chat from uh, Leonor that we will come back to in the discussions part um, of this webinar. Uh, but uh, it would be super useful, Isabel, if you could please share the resources in the chat. And thank you also for, um, you know, making the link uh, between the uh, displacement continuum, the vulnerability that the climate change may uh, uh, bring and exacerbate the situation of displaced persons and also still keeping uh, an eye on the fact that the situation of internally displaced persons and persons who had to flee their country uh, may have different implications as we all know but it's always good uh, to get reminded and also as you will see in the fact sheet um, uh, there are no grounds for climate refugees uh, as a term but uh, um, Isabel uh, uh, can provide more details uh, as needed in the discussion part. Very good. Thank you so much for framing it for us, Isabel. And I would now like to invite Alice uh, from OHCHR, please Alice, to share with us some concrete examples about how OHCHR actually works on this issue practically, specifically in Sahel region. And I see colleagues, we have a lot of uh, participants from Sahel countries, so it speaks a lot to colleagues uh, online. And uh, Alice, please, uh, if you would like to share with us uh, the examples, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, um, Valerie, for first of all 
inviting OHCHR to develop this joint fact sheet. And I really hope this will be a useful tool for colleagues in the field and at headquarters. And thank you very much for inviting me today. So I joined the migration and climate change and environment team at OHCHR in March this year as the project coordinator to implement the project in the Sahel, which is focusing on climate change related migration in free pilot countries. So we seek to better understand the human rights, climate change and migration nexus through community engagement in Nigeria, Niger and Mauritania. I will speak about the project findings briefly later on, but I would also like to indicate a few points that are very pertinent in the discharge of the project activities and that also highlight the findings and recommendations from the fact sheet. As pointed out in the fact sheet and as also mentioned by the Special Rapporteur previously, climate change is having clear, direct and indirect impacts on the effective enjoyment of a wide range of human rights. So these rights that are concerned are the rights to health, water and sanitation, food, housing, self-determination, the right to development, the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, and even the right to life itself. I think as practitioners, um, and we've all been to the field, we all recognize that interactions between climate change and migration are very complex. While migration allows people to move away from potentially harmful situation as an important adaptation strategy, the adverse effects of climate change are also compelling some people to migrate. And this may not necessarily be a free choice. What we can observe, including from documentation in the project, is that climate change can create or exacerbate situations of vulnerabilities. These, but also other factors such as social economic, demographic and political contexts, affect the ability of people to respond and to enjoy their human rights. This leads some people to move internally, as we have seen in previous examples, most of people are displaced internally, others also cross borders. And um, some are actually unable to move away from affected areas. UNHCR and OHCHR in the fact sheet recommend that climate action is people centered and that it adopts a human rights based approach, which means that the safety, dignity and the rights of those that are displaced in the context of climate change are respected. For instance, um, implementing, a human rights, implementing human rights obligations to address the needs and vulnerabilities of those adversely affected by climate change related events means that access to water and sanitation, access to health, to food, to self-determination and housing is guaranteed. States should further ensure that all persons have the capacity and means to adapt. Such measures can contribute to the reduction of vulnerabilities and risks and reduce the likelihood of migration for those who actually do not wish to move. People-centered climate action further means that proactive measures are taken to address and integrate rights into planning before harms occur. Because what we can see is that a human rights based approach to migration as adaptation could allow for better access to rights when people move and after. For instance, if we already foresee movement, we could also ensure access to labor markets, that they are guaranteed. This also means to facilitate migration as a choice rather than a necessity. And we can meet this um, demand by enhancing safe and regular pathways for migration. And facilitation in very extreme cases may entail planned relocation, which should always occur through the involvement of affected communities, whereby their rights to information and participation are guaranteed. States are also, um, in the context of migration, 
applied to assess the situation of those seeking to enter or remain on an individual basis. This assessment must determine whether a person can be returned and if and how they are entitled to specific human rights protections due to particular vulnerabilities. In the context of climate change, this translates as extending protection to those who do not qualify as refugees, but whose removal would be contrary to obligations under international human rights law, including, but of course not limited, to the principle of non-refoulement. And um, as mentioned, uh, by Valerie and in my introduction. OHCHR is involved in implementing projects in different parts of the world, seeking to better understand the climate change, human rights and migration nexus, and to identify and address potential protection gaps. So in the Sahel and through the engagement with communities in Nigeria, Niger and Mauritania, we are implementing a dedicated project to build capacities for right-based and gender-responsive approaches. Um, the project is very much focused on community engagement and empowerment, but also capacity building. And it seeks to identify protection gaps in the context of migration and that they identify adaptation and mitigation measures, measures to bridge these protection gaps. So there, um, as part of this project, there has been a report um, that was published in December last year, which presents already some of the findings. So one example is mentioned in the fact sheet, such an, is a, an example from Niger, which allows to recognize how challenges related to climate change are best addressed through the involvement of concerned communities. Um, and also what we have seen from the project is, for instance, the involvement of women in adaptation measures guarantees be better results and more long term um, solutions. And of course, there's plenty of other um, of other examples, and I'm very happy to see so many colleagues from the countries where we implement projects are present, but of course also many others who um, also deal with climate change related migration. And I'm very happy to to hear from your respective um, context and answer, of course, any questions that that you may have. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, this is uh, very interesting and useful. And you have actually, I believe, already responded to Leonora's uh, answer, uh, question in the chat, but we may go more into detail during the discussion part. I have also posted uh, the link to the report that Alice mentioned. But what I found particularly interesting, Alice, and how you interconnected the different uh, um, forms of displacement, because of course OHCHR is looking at uh, human rights of all persons. Your uh, mandate is very broad, and then uh, you encompass it under migration, but we know that uh, people in different situations face different challenges, and it's all interconnected, as both uh, Isabel and the special rapporteur were mentioning before. So you adding to their already uh, vulnerable situations and we need to pay particular attention also uh, to um, to mitigation measures and it links to uh, our exchange with uh, colleagues in Mozambique just before we started this event uh, uh, with um, Gwen and Hugo uh, when they were sharing that they are basically constantly preparing and uh, you know running against the wheel uh, trying to get ready for the uh, impact of climate change related event on displaced persons so uh, of course, thank you for sharing the example from uh, Sahel, the three countries, but uh, it impacts most countries uh, where we work. Uh, so thank you so much, Alice. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Nancy uh, from the Global Protection Cluster 
who will uh, share with us some key uh, elements about the GPC guidance that was recently issued and uh, Roberta will put a few slides on the screen. Uh, Nancy, you are joining us from your mission in Yemen. Thank you so much. Uh, um, the connection seems good, so please over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Valerie, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak about our GPC guidance. I hope everyone can hear me well. Great, thank you. So let me just begin by saying that I think this initiative is excellent. Um, the issue of climate change and displacement has been something that has been uh, an issue uh, for the protection clusters um, before I started the GPC two years ago. And uh, we've been asked by our, our colleagues at the field level to, to share over the years um, any guidance, any uh, advice that we could uh, share with them on how to approach both sudden and slow onset uh, natural hazards and disasters. So next slide, please. Thanks. So last year we brought in a consultant. Uh, we felt that we needed uh, expertise uh, to really help focus uh, the kind of guidance that we needed. Uh, because you know, at the fuel protection cluster level, there are many challenges uh, in our coordinator space, um, both in terms of conflict and climate change has also been an issue that has been raised on many occasions, and we've been asked on how to address that. So. Last year, we brought on board uh, a consultant for the GPC, and he and I worked closely with our, our colleagues in the field to organize a series of consultations, uh, as you see with the Americas, with the Africa operations, with Asia Pacific, and the MENA region. And during the discussions, we actually wanted to frame the guidance in a way that would be practical and, and usable and helpful. For our clusters. So as you can see, uh, we held discussions not only with our clusters, but with experts in the field. I see a lot of colleagues online that uh, we've consulted uh, from our INGO partners, the Danish Refugee Council, the Norwegian Refugee Council, to uh, OGHR, to colleagues from UNICEF and OCHA, um, and our cluster of colleagues really benefited as well um, from our discussions with our consultant about what they would like to see uh, about practical guidance for that. Next slide, please. So whenever we have the GPC produce guidance, we always wanted to see how us in the, in the GPC and in the protection clusters as protection actors, how we are working with our partners on the ground to be able to not only collaborate and bring synergies, but also how do we approach uh, the issue of climate change. It's not something that is always readily understandable by all actors. You don't necessarily have to be an expert is what we've kind of expressed to our teams on the field. Um, and so for them, they wanted to be able to use simple, clear language um, what, does it, what, what does it mean when you talk about natural hazards? What does it mean when you talk about slow onset or sudden onset? And the importance of, of obviously the centrality of protection, the accountability to affected populations. So we wanted to ensure that the terminology of climate change is there, as well as the terminology on protection, on issues of human rights, on issues of uh, protection, so that it would be understandable for all the protection stakeholders that we're working with. So obviously in the different operations that we work with, from the Pacific to obviously the colleagues that raised about the Sahel to the Americas, it's all about context analysis. So we always emphasize to them that we can of course share the guidance, but there are challenges that we face um, that obviously on protection in the issues of uh, unpreparedness that we would like to emphasize to also ensure that they're able to respond uh, effectively to our displaced persons. So here we received a lot of feedback from our coordinators, um, as you see, on to use common language, to use clear definitions. Um, obviously, we liaised with 
our partners uh, on the platform of disaster displacement, colleagues that work for NRC, um, other experts that have shared uh, their inputs with us, UNA chair colleagues from the Climate Action uh, Group, as well as UNA chair. So it's been really helpful to work closely with our colleagues from the different agencies to develop this guidance. And one of the other areas of uh, for us in the GPCs to look at as well as mobile NGOs, looking at our partners that have been there that are the first responders. So we felt that it was also important to show how we collaborate with them from the cluster to ensure that we are prepared for these silent and still lost events. Um, next slide, please. So what you'll see um, in our guidance, and I hope that the colleagues can share it, and I know that uh, Valerie and the team have shared it in the concept notice, that it's a mix of both electronic formats and checklists. So what we have is the guidance itself with about 20 pages, and we have an accompanying toolkit. So what we learned over the course of the last several months, um, so our consultant worked closely with um, the different experts and partners to develop this guidance uh, in a matter of five months is to make sure that we would be able to roll this guidance to the field. And it's been really helpful to see how our coordinators went back into what they would like to see, how we want to be able to use this through different checklists, through different uh, materials that have been used in the past. So it's not that we're creating something new, but we're also referencing a lot of the materials that are out there um, from words into action, uh, partners, uh, unique share has a series of uh, guidance that they have also, we've also referenced in our GPC uh, preparedness guidance on climate change. And I think that one of the key parts, and I think here to talk about a bit more is to we use as well good examples, good practices from the field. And um, in the guidance, we flag uh, the next slide, please. Um, we just here just to see like the format. Uh, so here we talk about the terminologies and it's sort of straightforward to the point. We are able to use this so that when our coordinators are working with whether the local governments or our little engineer our partners that were able to work in the same language and in the same terminology as protection and actors. So we also, if you uh, move to the next slide, please. We also wanted to highlight um, a bit of the good practices that we've seen. And I think it's really important as cluster coordinators to, to share across even regions, to share across uh, different situations. And what we've seen uh, and what we've highlighted in our guidance is, for instance, in the Pacific Islands, they've been at the forefront, obviously, with a lot of the, the challenges on climate change that they've uh, experienced, they had developed planned relocation uh, guidelines uh, by the Fiji government that have been published. And they have worked closely with the local communities that have been affected um, and developed this with their local partners. So for us, that showed and demonstrated some examples that we were able to also uh, share with other, with other clusters in the field. And for instance, in the Philippines, um, a technical working group had been developed uh, which included with other humanitarian organizations and stakeholders and working with local and national governments to look at how we could do a proper protection analysis and input that into a, a, a local and a national strategy um, in, the, in the Mindanao region. So that was a, another good practice that we also highlighted. Um, and in uh, Eastern Horn in Africa, we see in the cluster for Somalia, they had done an in-depth protection analysis, which also helped them to address and to highlight the multiple protection risks uh, due to displacement as well as to the drought situation um, and how they were able to respond to some of the unlawful evictions that were happening as a result of these two challenges for them. So I think, um, next slide please. I think that was uh, some of the key areas for us 
to look at uh, this series of the practices, uh, some of the lessons learned we've seen from different clusters and how that can enhance the work that we're doing practically from the GBC. So as, as Valerie mentioned, we launched the, the guidance on the 24th of March. We did a soft rollout in Zimbabwe. Um, I introduced the guidance to some of the protection cluster members during a session where my GBC colleagues on the mission. And we are in the in the process of rolling it out in more operations um, and hope to get more feedback from other clusters. And we'll continue from this year into the next in 2023. So thanks. Um, thank you for your time. And over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Nancy and uh, colleagues. For those who are not yet familiar with this tool, it's really very practical with a lot of examples, easy to uh, find information. And so we strongly encourage you to uh, browse through it if you are interested to get some inspiration. And again, as previously mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out to colleagues if you would like to discuss bilaterally also the situation in your respective cluster or operation so that we can see how to better support. So thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, colleagues, the um, uh, link to the toolkit is uh, or tool uh, guidance is uh, in the chat. Uh, I see that we have uh, some uh, questions coming in. That's fantastic. Uh, I do encourage you to use the chat if you would like to uh, to hear more from our panelists about some aspects of uh, of uh, the work they do, the uh, resources they mentioned, or um, to discuss broader this topic and also how it relates to to the situation of displacement. Uh, we uh, also saw a comment from um, uh, from Sumbul from UNHCR drawing our attention to the um, uh, to the upcoming SG's action agenda on internal displacement, which will come soon, and which also applies to situation. Um, uh, of people displaced by climate change. So it's a very important uh, momentum and also as along with the SG's call to action for human rights, which is very important for us. And we hope really uh, create space for you at country level also to discuss those issues uh, um, more broadly at uh, HCT level, UNCT level with also agencies, entities that may not have directly protection uh, mandates such as UNHCR or HCHR, but get the momentum uh, to advance collectively on some of those topics, uh, those are really two in important initiatives that are upcoming, as well as the agenda for protection, system-wide agenda for protection, which uh, which will be launched this year. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo. Also, uh, thank you for sharing the link to the uh, wonderful report you have done in Mozambique on uh, on the cyclone uh, impact uh, uh, on the protection environment. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, well done for this one. A good practice example. And maybe you can share more uh, details in the discussion. But as we uh, collect the questions, I would like to invite Meron from OHCHR also to very briefly describe what uh, tool is going to be launched actually next week, and what is coming your way as an appetizer uh, for all of you. So over to you, please, uh, Meron. Um, many thanks, Valerie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Meron. I work in uh, UNHCR's IDP section um, as an associate protection officer. Um, and I just want to say a few words um, about the guidance on IDP protection in the context of disasters and climate change that um, UNHCR developed late last year. Um, as you are aware, and as mentioned during earlier presentations, the majority of um, displacement in the context of disasters and, and climate change occurs internally. Uh, over 30 million people were displaced due to disasters in, in 2020 alone, according to the Internal uh, Displacement Monitoring Center. And people displaced um, due to disasters experience various um, protection risks. So the development of this guidance is something that is uh, much needed to ensure that 
uh, protection is uh, um, central to humanitarian response in, in disaster uh, situations. Uh, the guidance covers uh, a range of issues, including uh, the role of protection actors in, in preparedness. Um, this is very important um, as science and community-based early warning systems um, allow us to anticipate the occurrence of certain disasters, um, enabling us to take um, measures uh, early on um, to reduce human uh, suffering. The guidance also uh, covers the role of protection actors um, in disaster response. Um, more importantly, uh, it emphasizes the importance of uh, ensuring a human rights based approach, uh, which again is critical uh, because it's often an overlooked area in, in disaster response, uh, despite the uh, fact that affected populations, uh, including IDPs, uh, face many uh, human rights um, challenges. Um, the guidance is primarily developed uh, for the UNHCR staff, uh, but it contains uh, useful information uh, relevant for um, other protection uh, actors. Um, I'll put the link uh, of the to the guidance in, in, in the chat box and, and, and thanks. Um, over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, uh, Meron. Very useful. So, colleagues, uh, I think the situation has evolved. When we, you know, I remember a few years ago, uh, there were very little resources on this topic. And, uh, uh, you know, the research was starting. There were some discussions in the Human Rights Forum. But now we see really a lot of very practical tools, uh, guidances, and you can go as deep as you want, but you have uh, some frameworks that are existing to support you, good practices, uh, examples. So uh, it has evolved quite a lot since the last few years, and we hope that all those uh, um, documents will be very useful for you. Thanks, Meron, also for sharing the link in the chat. Uh, this is well received. Excellent. So I would propose that we open up now for for a discussion, for an exchange, and uh, I will go back to the panelists and colleagues. Please take the questions as you feel uh, relevant and uh, uh, complement uh, each other. We have received interesting question from uh, from Shaista. Uh, in Pakistan, we would like to know more if you can already share some good practices or lessons learned on um, uh, how to strengthen the humanitarian development nexus on climate change, um, so including what it entails in terms of uh, uh, coordination, collaboration, funding, um, risks, assessment. So, uh, covering all the aspects of prevention, mitigation and response. So you, if you can tackle the aspect of the humanitarian development nexus, so you have some uh, aspects from the climate change angle, if there, this has already been done and some good practices or lessons learned are existing. I'm sure, Shaista, your question, of course, coming from Pakistan operation could could be relevant to any basically any country so this is very relevant uh, i would also go back to uh, uh, to the question by leonora uh, on what has been the role of the affected population in uh, in uh, linking uh, clearly the ca climate change and the situation um, of displaced per persons and enjoyment of their human rights, how they have been involved, um, what good practices or examples you could share, especially at least if you go uh, could go a little bit more into detail, maybe or uh, in the guide that Nancy presented us, there are also some examples. But it would be interesting to hear more. We also had a question from Sophie, and it's in relation, Isabel, to uh, your presentation. And uh, Sophie pointed out that it would be interesting to hear how the principle of non refoulement um, is used um, in the context of uh, climate, uh, climate change and climate related uh, disasters. Um, so if, if you could tackle that 
uh, in in uh, the scope uh, which is possible. And uh, um, Hugo, thank you for sharing further resources uh, in the chat. Uh, I would propose that we go back to the panelists with those initial three questions and we take it from there. To, as you would like to take them, colleagues. OK, Isabel, would you like to start? And Alice and Nancy, yes, over to you. Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks, Sophie, for your question. Um, I think that's a very good question. And um, that's also related to what Valérie was uh, highlighting earlier on the, the question of climate refugees, because it touches a bit uh, the same uh, issue, um, to my view. Um, when you're asking about how to uh, persuade states to extend um, non refoulement to those displaced uh, in relation to climate change and disasters, it's actually not about extending um, obligations or, or rights or creating new instruments. It's really about um, understanding how existing instruments and existing rights um, actually apply in um, new challenges that emerge in the context of climate change and disasters. Um, referring to the case of Teciota and the decision um, from the Human Rights Committee, uh, really the the the. the um, the, 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 the committee uh, recognized that in the context of uh, sea level rise and of the impacts of, uh, of climate change uh, on, on, on the level of, of sea, um, the, um, the, the impacts of climate change could uh, really um, threaten the right to life. Uh, of people and could also be um, seen as inhuman or degrading treatment of punishment. And in this specific context, the existing rights and instruments might be applicable and uh, trigger international uh, obligation under international law. It is um, the same for uh, the application of refugee instruments or any other instrument. It's not about uh, recognizing a new category of persons, such as, for instance, when we 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 talk about climate refugees, it's about um, interpreting how the existing uh, legal normative instruments uh, can be can be applicable and relevant to these new um, and contemporary challenges. Uh, this is a bit what uh, was done, um, for instance, in the past in UNHCR on gender related issues. We did, there was no creation of new category of persons, of gender refugees or whatever, but it was recognized that in the context of, uh, of, of gender, some specific protection issues and concerns might be raised and needed to be acknowledged to interpret properly the existing instruments. Um, I don't know if it replies to your question. I hope it clarifies. Um, I would like also to mention, um, to reply to the question or say a, a quick word on uh, the humanitarian development nexus. Uh, indeed, um, um, when we talk about displacement and preventing displacement, there's a, the whole um, resilience building dimension is really relevant. Um, and working in, develop, in cooperation with development partners, with governments uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other partners, private sector uh, finance uh, partners is uh, really key to ensure that uh, communities are resilient, are prepared, uh, and the societies uh, have better coping strategies in case of natural hazards to uh, prevent disasters from occurring and to prevent uh, displacement. This is um, uh, really um, all the human mobility discussions we are having uh, to, to strengthen uh, the overall um, response and situations in countries. Over. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. This is very useful. I see that it responded to Sophie's question, so that's very, very good. Uh, I see uh, Cecilia's hand, so I would first give the floor to the special reporter. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Cecilia. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Valerie, and thanks for the um, very elaborate uh, answer of Isabel to this question. Um, I guess this is very much also a legal question, and you know, as a lawyer, I get excited about legal questions. So um, I'm sorry about that, but I just wanted to bring your attention actually to a decision that was done by the UN um, Committee on the Rights of the Child last October, 2021, when in a historic ruling, the committee, committee said that the harmful effects of climate change on uh, children's rights can actually um, lead uh, to a state being held responsible for the negative impact of its carbon emissions on the rights of children, both within and outside its territory. It did, did not rule so much on its protective responsibilities for children, but we can actually use this for any derivative protection um, advocacy because it's um, it's the first such ruling by an international body after examining uh, a petition filed by 16 children and it found that emitting states are actually responsible for this negative impact of the emissions even though those children may be located abroad. So this means that um, states may be held uh, accountable uh, for that. Um, as I said, it does not really bear any direct um, accountability yet with regard to movement, migration, or acceptable displacement. However, I think the implications of that ruling um, can be derived in terms of what protection uh, the children may have. So there's a lot of discussion right now among the legal circles on what, what this actually means. And uh, in my view, there is an implication on migration and displacement on this. But anyway, it's just to share with you um, that ruling and my excitement because of that uh, ruling. So thanks very much, Valerie. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for sharing the information about this ruling and uh, also expanding more on Isabel's uh, intervention. And we will be also sharing after this webinar a summary of the resources uh, and uh, also uh, the ruling that Cecilia mentioned so that you can go more into depth uh, in it. But very, very fascinating topic. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. So, um, um, Nancy, over to you and then Alice, thank you. Thanks, Valerie. So I just had a quick comment uh, related to the question on the humanitarian peace development nexus. So it is true that we do devote a, a, a small section uh, on, on this in the guidance, and we do present examples um, because it, I know that uh, Isabel also mentioned the issue of resilience. And in ours, obviously, we're looking as well uh, in terms of IDPs, looking as well as enhancing the prospects uh, for solutions. Uh, so we gave two examples uh, that we had heard about uh, through our discussions and consultations. For example, in Tonga, uh, uh, groups uh, that were being considered as very vulnerable, such as the elderly and persons with disabilities, uh, were most those who had been severely impacted by the cyclone in Aikita back in 2018. So the government had looked into this um, and decided to use the existing social protection mechanisms as part of the emergency response, and they targeted both the elderly and uh, the people, the persons with disabilities uh, that were affected. And eventually their response was to look into cash and voucher assistance um, and other social welfare mechanisms. Um, so in that respect, uh, I thought uh, maybe not applicable to the colleague who's uh, in Pakistan, but perhaps other examples that we share in the guidance might be useful to him. So over to you, thanks, Valerie. Thank you so much, Nancy, for providing those elements and uh, uh, very important. Uh, I see that we have also a few comments and further questions coming in in the chat. I will take the second round, but first give the floor to Alice and thank you also, Kim, for posting um, uh, the link to the 
uh, uh, to the uh, CRC uh, link in the chat. Uh, I see that uh, Shaista, uh, thank also Nancy that you have provided a lot of answers for her questions. So this has been very useful. Thank you so much again, Nancy. And over to you, Alice. Thank you very much. And also, thank you for the question which evolves around the recommendation to adopt a human rights based approach to displaced persons. And um, the question actually um, asks us to speak more about how to engage the voices and the views of displaced persons. So I guess what this recommendation entails is to actually always um, come from a rights-based approach where the rights of persons are, are, are the most important. And um, what I mentioned be before is that this entails that states create a situation which allow, or other stakeholders as well, which allow to ensure that persons have the capacity and the means to adapt to climate change, so that they're not um, that migration is not um, a necessity, but that it can actually be a choice. And also, states can actually take action before harm occurs by pre better preparing um, if things are are clear such as in slow onset events and rising sea level or, or other um, climate change effects, um, one can better prepare. And I think the special rapporteur mentioned also in her um, introductory remarks the situation of indigenous peoples, maybe she can add more on this later on, but there's also collective rights to self-determination and um, we know about the attachment of indigenous peoples to, to land. So um, if a relocation is the only solution, it's very important to actually place these people at the center and their right to information, their right to participation and self-determination. So this would be so uh, a very important um, situation of where a human rights based approach is, is really needed. Um, from the project in the Sahel, um, there's maybe one really good example, um, which is the one also mentioned in the fact sheet in Niger. So we really exchange on a regular basis with communities to listen to their um, concerns and needs and um, human rights violations or protection gaps and also try to, to match these or to inform authorities about the concerns to make sure there's better protection from the state side on these rights. And for instance, in Niger, there was a community-led tree planting initiative, which um, improved livelihood opportunities, but also drought resilience and reduced food insecurities. And in this project, there was also uh, an incentive to actually provide accommodation for the movement of pastoralists, which is oftentimes um, the source of, of conflict and ethnic tensions in the region. Um, so this is a, I would say, best practice, but then we've also observed other situations, for instance, um, where the Green Climate Fund in the, in the Sahel um, focused very much on the promotion of sustainable agricultural methods, but people in rural communities actually wanted to focus more rather than fo continuing to focus on agriculture which is which is very um prone to to be affected by climate change events what their um needs were and what they said is to actually include non-farming opportunities so they that they can have various source or various possibilities to have sources of in income and sustain their their livelihood um, maybe others have have um, additional information or, or want to add anything and I hope I've answered the question or given a better idea of what we mean. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Alice. And I find it very interesting the, uh, what you just mentioned, the new opportunities in the non-farming and actually uh, exploring this uh, aspect as well. Um, you mentioned other good practices, tree planting and uh, uh, links to the livelihood opportunities. Uh, um, thank you. And uh, colleagues, I refer you back to the fact sheet to also look at the other practices and uh, the GPC guidance where you can already find some inspiration but uh, it's interesting to hear from uh, from the field and i would uh, maybe go to the second round of uh, questions if we have few minutes uh, dear panelists if you can shed some light and especially to questions one um by uh, uh jean nicolas from, from iraq and uh um, who is uh, uh, asking about uh, how can we actually ascertain the responsibilities of a specific state or public institutions, given that the um, public official or the person acting uh, in an official capacity is an element of the legal obligation when the responsibilities for climate change cannot be necessarily linked to one single state. Unless we speak about uh, an island, of course, as uh, um, we have seen in the past. So very interesting one. It would be great to hear some insight on that. And also a very practical point from Hugo, which uh, is coming from Mozambique, but I am sure other colleagues, especially clusters, would also maybe share similar challenge to the difficulties when we are submitting projects to surf uh, and other humanitarian actors and the lack of acknowledgement that uh, protection activities are uh, an important aspect when uh, dealing with climate change impacts in situations of displacement. And Hugo is asking whether actually there is, uh, there are already efforts at a global level, especially with donors, in stressing this uh, this link and the importance of investments into those areas, as we discussed, to build the resilience of people and uh, to work in prevention as well uh, uh, mitigations etc so um, noting that so far most of the work is actually done by by the local civil society members and Jews which is very good empowering local actors but in relation to the financial sources and the importance of taking the knowledge that it's beyond uh, water pipes is beyond you know um, uh, shutters it's the protection aspect is key it seems to be still lacking there so i would go back to you with those those questions and dear panelists if you have some quick points or highlights to share with us before we close this event um if you can please raise your hand if you would like to take the floor isabel please uh, get us started Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot, uh, Jean-Nicolas, for your questions regarding um, inhuman or degrading treatment and uh, the responsibilities of uh, specific state or public institutions. I share Cecilia's excitement when I hear about new cases, and uh, really, uh, I, I really go through the analysis and the legal arguments because we see that um, litigation in cases are increasing and there are really interesting insights that are being brought to the climate dimension. Um, I would like to share with you um, uh, a case that I've read, um, that's a case from two years ago. Um, I think uh, it's a case that um, uh, took place in Germany uh, uh, from the Baden-Württemberg court uh, in December 2020. And it was about a man from uh, Afghanistan, an adult, who uh, was to be deported. And the decision was um, on, on whether to, to deport uh, him uh, back to Afghanistan. And um, the court this recalled that uh, in uh, very exceptional individual cases, bad humanitarian conditions 
can constitute treatment within the meaning of the uh, Article 3 uh, of the European Court on Human Rights um, uh, on the prohibition of torture on inhuman degrading punishment or treatment, representing non-state dangers to, uh, due to precarious living condition. And it's uh, in its assessment of the humanitarian situation, the court recognized the need to conduct, to conduct a multifactorial analysis, including not only, uh, for instance, gener general economic situation or linked to the behavior of specific actors, but also um, the, uh, assess the, the, the level of supply of uh, food, living healthcare, and environmental conditions such as climate and disasters as well as the security situation so the climate element was not central to that um, decision uh, and it was decided not to to return that man to afghanistan but indeed it recognized that um, the, the, the 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 overall um, uh, living condition of uh, of uh, of the persons including in relation to environmental conditions had to be taken into account i'm very happy to put a link to 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 that uh, decision in the chat box if it's uh, of interest to you. I would also like to highlight in case uh, you find it interesting that uh, tomorrow um, at six o'clock Geneva time uh, there's a webinar uh, on disaster related displacement into Europe, uh, an analysis of judicial practice in Austria and Sweden that uh, it's a study that uh, uh, has been conducted over the last two years. And uh, it finds out that um, subsidiary protection has been granted uh, to people uh, in Austria, in particular in relation to climate change uh, related elements. So I really look forward to that webinar, which is tomorrow. Uh, six o'clock Geneva time. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I will also put a link um, uh, to that. Um, maybe one uh, last point that I wanted to raise, uh, the, the NGO consultations that will take, take place in, in June um, next month uh, um, um, have a, a theme on climate action this year. We are working with uh, ICVA and NGO partners in developing uh, them. There will be two subsections, one on operational uh, con uh, elements and one on law and policy. It uh, both will be uh, uh, held on the 9th of June. You are very welcome if you want to go deeper into these discussions and share practices. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, of course, as Cecilia pointed out, this case uh, happened before uh, the Taliban um, uh, takeover in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, well noted also Jean Nicolas' comment. Um, it's linked to Linets and Chaista uh, feedback also on the uh, holding the government's accountability and the role and the responsibilities. I, if there is really an interest, I think the TASIM could go a little bit deeper in those discussions. There could be a dedicated uh, session in the future or see how how to discuss more in detail. This could be one of the action points. I'm wondering, Nancy, if in uh, one minute you would like to come back on Hugo's question related to SERF, but more specifically the effort being done at global level with donors to ensure that protection is more taken into account into the uh, fundraising uh, or financial opportunities uh, in uh, humanitarian displacement settings. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mallory. I actually didn't want to answer that question because we haven't yet really raised that. Um, and I think it's a very important point from Hugo. I'm in the midst actually in Yemen to looking at the surf, but on food insecurity at the moment. Uh, but we just had a two hour discussion on flood preparedness yesterday with the government in Yemen. So, yeah, I think it's it's a really good point and a good ask. So, yeah, I will definitely follow that up when I'm back in Geneva. But well worded, Hugo, and it's a really important issue for all of us in the cluster. So over to you, Valerie. 
Thank you so much, Nancy and colleagues. You see, this is why those uh, peer exchange webinars are also important because it pushes us more at the global level to uh, to uh, um, do um, efforts, uh, conduct efforts that support you and uh, that uh, can uh, give you more, uh, I would say, uh, positive <laughs> conditions to then do also the advocacy at country level. So thank you so much. I'm afraid we are coming to the end of our uh, exchange for today, but of course uh, this is uh, an initial um, exchange we have had uh, together in the space of the Human Rights Engagement Task Team. Uh, uh, this will continue as already foreshadowed. We are planning to have a dedicated webinar with a special reporter on climate change in June, so uh, you can look forward to it. And uh, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, that were able to join us today. Of course, uh, Cecilia, the special reporter. Um, it has been an immense pleasure, Cecilia, uh, to uh, work with you. If I can <laughs> uh, um, also say this personal um, word to you, because you have been supporting us on many fronts uh, um, uh, from your office and through your mandate in different initiatives uh, through your country missions, uh, um, your thematic reports, consultations, advocacy messages. The list would be long, but uh, you are really key for our work. So thank you for supporting us also today in this exchange and uh, Colleagues, uh, our dear panelists from UNHCR, GPC, OHCHR, I think it shows that this topic is really um, to be tackled in a holistic manner, not only by, of course, one agency entity, but more collectively in joint efforts also between humanitarian development actors looking at the root causes and uh, uh, maybe having also a longer term uh, plan uh, beside addressing the emergency situation. So thank you so much for sharing the insight with us. And I think we have some follow ups uh, to do on our side. Um, uh, I will close this event, but uh, also let me mention that this is uh, from my side the last webinar that I will um, I'm doing on behalf of the human rights engagement task team as I'm moving to a new role a new role in Iraq joining Jean Nicola. So uh, the monthly webinars will, of course, continue. Uh, Roberta will uh, hold the fourth before my replacement comes on board. So thank you so much, Roberta. Colleagues, you will be receiving invitations uh, from her for the upcoming events. The next one being on 18th of May during the Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Week. So a um, very interesting one on uh, collaboration with regional human rights mechanisms with focus on Africa and there will be much more to come. So from my side, thank you so much for uh, all those exchanges throughout the last uh, two years and uh, I look forward uh, to hearing uh, from the task team how things are going and uh, being in touch in one way or another. So thanks so much and uh, um, have a good rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.